episode of Donuts and Demand. We're so excited for you to join us today. We're going to be talking about how demand generation can build a trusted and loved brand. So to get started, I am going to intro our first guest. So first off, we have Susanna Blau. She is the head of digital demand and marketing campaigns, Nokia Cloud and Network Services. Susanna, hello. We're so excited to have you here today. So I want to ask, what is your favorite donut type? What do you bring to the show today? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm more excited to be here than you are to have me. Um, my favorite do donut, um, it's probably because I used to live in Boston, but one of them is definitely Boston cream. So I've, I, I, it took me years to find Boston cream in Hungary, because I'm, I'm based in Hungary, as you guys know, Budapest representing, but the other one, <laughs> the other one is um, pistachio filled with raspberry on top. And that's just to show that I can get extra sometimes. <laughs> I love it. That sounds super delicious. And that red is really beautiful. Um, I, if there are any uh, Midwesterners in the crowd today, I don't know if this is an Indianapolis only or a Midwest regional, um, but I went to Rise and Roll, which is like an Amish style bakery. And I have a um, marshmallow filled chocolate covered donut. So it is Ooh delicious. So next off, I'm going to introduce our second guest today. I'm so excited. We have a full panel of women today. Can I just say that? Like the fact that we have three ladies working in B2B tech on the show today is super exciting for me. So next, I'm going to introduce Sarah McConnell. She is VP Demand Generation at Qualified. Sarah, where is your donut from? Hey, Sarah. Oh, hi. <laughs> How's it going? You're on stage. <laughs> I feel like I've like walked out of the curtain onto stage. Like I love, I really do love the gold cast setup. It's just so cool and like feels very real. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. So tell us what kind of donut did you grab today and where is it from? Okay, so I went very traditional, but very fun. And I did a sprinkle chocolate donut because um, one, it makes me feel like a kid and I love it. And I got it from just like a local donut shop down the road, which I'm really, I've never tried before. So I'm I'm very excited. Oh, nice. Well, I hopefully it meets your expectations. And I love that it's, well, some people might not love this because it might be too early for them, but the Christmas sprinkles, it's it's very cute. I so. know. And honestly, it's a donut, so you can't go wrong. It could have been any donut and I would have been happy to have it. <laughs> so to get us kicked off and in the right demand generation mood, I'm going to ask you kind of a simple yet a kind of complicated question. So Sarah, we're going to start with you, but how do you define demand generation? You're right. It is a complicated question that has, I feel like everyone has different answers, but to me, it is actually just the word demand. So am I creating demand for my company and my product? So I actually think it spans beyond just like acquisition and bringing in, obviously, I think a lot about pipeline. That is like the metric that I am held accountable to. It's what I'm thinking about every day, but I don't think you can drive demand and therefore pipeline without awareness. So I feel like it encompasses a little bit of everything. It can touch product marketing, content marketing, events, demand gen. So I actually think it's very broad. And I like that you brought the brand element into it because I feel like a lot of people, when they talk about demand gen, they forget about brand and like the awareness part, right? Like you can't buy if you're unaware. <laughs> Absolutely. So Susanna, over to you, the easy right. yet question. How do you define demand generation? Yeah, I agree with Sarah. To me, demand gen is definitely an investment in brand and a you know, a bet on the future, so to say. It's seeding the market, it's priming your audiences, and it's really talking about your category more than your product. So it's more educational, it's more generic, it's aiming to obviously raise awareness and interest. Um, that is demand for me, demand gen. Oh, I like the simplicity of the leaning into your category more than your product. That is genius. And uh, I think I'm going to steal that. So this leads us into our first segment. So we are heading into Sprinkles of Demand. So Sprinkles of Demand is really our quick hit section where both of our guests tell just two or three quick and dirty tips about demand generation. So they can take it in kind of any perspective or direction they want to. Susanna, we are going to start with you. So what Sprinkles of Demand Gen Wisdom do you have for our audience today? Okay, so one of them is definitely 
the notion that people buy from brands that they know, love, and trust, meaning that the most underrated marketing strategy would be, one, be genuinely nice and care about your audiences and literally show up consistently with free, ungated content that, again, educates, entertains, informs uh, your audiences, make it an experience for them, a bingeable experience, something that they would be used to from their consumer background, right? Everyone knows Netflix and Spotify and Amazon, all the, you know, the creators of the bingeable and on-demand world. So that is something that we need to also think of experiences um, when we create our content and put it in front of our audiences. So that would be one. Um, and then the other one is actually, um, on top of this, whoever gets closer or closest to the customer will win. And so before you start creating 100 pieces meant to influence your audience's behavior, make sure that you do 100 hours of, of market or audience research as well. I think um, especially in B2B, uh, a lot of times brands will just churn out content. They are used to creating a lot of content and, and then kind of start forcing existing content into the journey and don't understand why there's only 300 views on a blog or on a white paper. So again, do the research before you start creating content men to influence your, um, your audience's behavior. I love that. And you bring up a point that actually I've been talking a lot in my prep calls for the series masterclass we're about to run is the fact that many brands have an ongoing event series. So they have that direct access to their audience. And you're no longer just like, you know, that quintessential saying, throwing spaghetti at the wall or shooting in the dark, right? Like the more you have those back and forths and I mean, sorry y'all, but I'm using you as a test group donuts and demand audience. Like, you know, I'm trying to figure out what resonates with you and, and what my team should be producing to attract you. So excellent point, fell right into the purpose of the show, Susanna. So Sarah, now it's over to you. What sprinkles of demand do you have to share? Yeah, so actually my first one, I think ties really well to Susanna's first or last point, which was not planned, but is I think in demand, Jen, we forget that there is always someone internal to our organization who's a subject matter expert and that we should lean on them more, not just our customers. Obviously, that's a great avenue, as you just mentioned, but I'm really lucky that I market to marketers and our end buyer is typically me at another organization. And I forget how often I need to like step back and think about what do I actually want? Like, why am I, I'm not just creating content or assets just blindly, but what would I find useful in my own role? And if I wasn't in this role at my organization and we sold to someone on the sales side or someone in the engineering side, I think it's so important to talk to that person very frequently, run things by them, just have like standing meetings with them to make sure what you're putting out is resonating with, is it making them better at their job? Is it driving some sort of like betterment to them? Because that's good content. It's making someone better and offering them value. And then I think my second one, because we are sort of in like budget planning season and data demand gen, I spend so much time in data. It's just a constant. I'm always looking at, what's happening, why trying to draw hypotheses on, on what is happening. And I think one of my biggest pieces of advice is, is one, it's one thing to spend time in the data, but it's so important to be able to tell a narrative around that data. And it's something that's taken me a long time to learn, which is all the data in the world, is it going to do you any good if you can't package that up into a story and tell it to your leadership team or whoever kind of holds the purse strings and, and makes decisions on where you should be spending time and money? Because if you can't tell that story, the data isn't doing you any good. So as someone who avoided math at all costs in school, um, I now spend a lot of time in data, but realize my comms background did actually come in handy because now that I've learned the data, I can lean on that kind of communications background to make sure I'm telling the story of the data to get buy-in from my leadership team. Hmm. I want to dig into that one just a little bit there. So are you talking about kind of a story as far as like how you're pitching that data or is it more like, oh, I put it in a beautiful PowerPoint and it's very easy to kind of jump through. Like, well, what no, do you need for that? I kind of think it's both. And I think to, to the second point of like putting it in a PowerPoint, one of my pieces of advice is know what your leadership team likes. Like I've worked for different leaders who would prefer it in different formats, but I've learned, for example, it qualified, my executive team really loves a good PowerPoint and they don't want it busy. They want it very visual and like to the point. 
And it's taken a lot of learning to figure out the right formatting. How do I make it like visually appealing? But then also what's the ordering of those slides? Like how am I getting the quick hits in front and then supporting it? Like even just the, um, I guess the format and the the flow of the story that I'm telling is really important. And I think bringing hypotheses and then showing that data and being able to communicate why I feel this way and why I'm asking for budget or why I'm asking for allocation and resources, I have to be able to get their kind of their hearts and minds. Like I have to be able to convince them that this is worthwhile. And as I can't, it can't just be in data. It's got to be like visual. It's got to be appealing and like to the point. Yeah, I mean, if, if, his, if you don't mind me just adding to that, I think fortifying the CMO's relationship with the C-suite is so important nowadays. Um, you have to connect your KPIs to growth or revenue metrics. You have to put things in context. Um, they won't know what good is. I so agree. You have to understand what they like and don't like, but also they won't know what good is unless you tell them. So um also communicate in financial terms, right? Instead of saying our, I don't know, email campaign delivered 10% CTR and generated 50 MQLs, we would, you know, have to say we generated 1 million pipeline that's yep. expected to convert um, to 400K in uh, revenue based on historical conversion rates. It will speak in their language. They will understand you better and therefore they will like you better as well. Totally. That's key. Getting to be liked better, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you both make excellent points. And I think it kind of hones into where we started this conversation of knowing your audience, right? Like that is key and crucial, whether internal or external. So now we're going to jump into our next topic. And if you've joined us for Donuts and Demand before, usually we have both speakers on each topic. But this one, we're actually doing a special version. And each of our speakers are going to have one topic all to themselves. So this one is for Susanna. So this is Bringing in the Dough. So this segment is all about reporting, attribution, numbers, kind of what we were alluding to earlier in our conversation. And Susanna, I know you have a lot of thoughts about the topic of attribution, goal setting, reporting. So let's dive right in into bringing in the dough. Right. So one thing I know I wish I knew about marketing when I first started was that before people spend money with you, they will spend time with you. Um, and so you need to be able to know when they do, right? So measure the amount of time that they spend with your brand because it's a it's an excellent indicator of when they are ready to be sold to. So again, just going back to what I said earlier, make sure your content strategy reflects that because if you offer ungated and bingeable personalized experiences, you will actually facilitate their self-education phase. Um, but in your outreach strategy as well, you know, you need to be able to track that somehow if they are spending time with you. Um, most of your growth potential really lies in reaching people who may not be buying from you today, but who will buy from you in the future. So enable them to spend time with you. One thing, though, marketers love to track everything. And I feel like we need to be able to let that go, that attribution and tracking for tracking sake go and understand that not everything can be tracked. Quite frankly, in Nokia, we have um, 12 to 24 month sales cycles, multiple billion dollar multi-year deals sometimes. So I understand that, that, you know, 100K plus deals will not convert on an ad or just a bi-weekly email that is part of a nurture. So again, building demand takes time. It's really like, like sowing seeds, right? So there may be no visible activities above ground for a long while, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any activities at all. In fact, the most important research and conversations actually happen in the dark which you, you might have heard the term the dark funnel or dark social. So there's a lot happening if you think about um, social lurking or direct messages or someone listening to a podcast or you know reading up reviews on a review site or a radio ad, a TV ad. Um, 
store visits or someone pops in to your booth at an event, um, direct mail and so, so on and so on. There are lots of tactics actually that are without a click, without a form fill, without a download, a conversion, without attribution. So you won't be able to understand where most of your um, traffic may really come from or conversions may really come from in the long run. And so I feel like us marketers really need to learn how to value these touch points for what they truly are, which is a chance to burn our key messaging into the back of our buyers' minds, again, to build trust and let them get to know us and get to love us better. Um, so I also understand with that said that B2B inflation is, is real. Um, you have to be in multiple channels. The, you know, the number of channels are growing. The number of touch points are constantly growing. I just read actually research from Google and Susie, which is not me, <laughs> that the average um, um, buyer journey in B2B from consideration stage, so that's not even from awareness, it's from consideration stage, is 23 weeks, which is um, pretty much six months. And that happens across about 23 different uh, personas. So really, again, it takes more of everything to win, more channels, more ads, more content formats, and we need to be able to produce all that content from faster and cheaper. And it, it can really feel like a no-win game sometimes. So um, going back to how people spend time with you, if you have these indicators that allow you to see when they do and you, there are tools out there that will let you do that like goldcast is one of them right you will have fantastic um uh, back-end analytics um you'll be able to track that and understand who's ready to be sold to and move them to the next uh, uh journey stage and a final thought on this prioritize because if you have too many goals for something um, or just a laundry list of tactics in your marketing plan, then you're spreading yourself too thin. So um, make sure you understand what the overall business goal is. There's a great framework that I really like uh, to do this and to, to set your marketing plan as we are all in planning phase right now. It's the GOST plan, G-O-S-T. Uh, it breaks down to one clear business goal, um, one or two objectives that are absolutely aligned to this one business goal, and then three or four strategic initiatives to deliver on the objectives, um, and then tactics, a couple of tactics for each. And my recommendation is get this planned out for the next quarter in more detail, but for the rest of the year in just higher level planning, and then get it signed off and agreed to before each quarter. That way, you will allow you um, you know you will um, allow yourself to be able to push back on interruptions. We all know there are always just random requests and um, interruptions from leadership teams and from your peers throughout the year. But you can then just refer back to the signed off uh, priorities and and strategy that you've created. And most importantly, this is really for your team. They'll be able to prioritize better. Everyone's going to be on the same page, following the same, you know, direction and vision. Um, so it will definitely give everyone confidence to go um, and align and, and move in the same direction. Well, that was a lot of great information, Susanna. And I will say the way you close that resonates with me because one of my talk tracks I've been doing a lot in presenting, um, if anyone was at demand for metadata, my presentation talked about how you have to have everyone singing the same song from the same song book. And if you don't take the time to level set there and make sure everyone's on the same page and you're honestly like kind of shooting yourself on the foot, um, I have a challenge for those watching in the chat. I'd love to know when it comes to marketing attribution and maybe convincing leadership or peers or your department to kind of like what Susanna said, let go a little bit of those track uh, trackable data points that might not actually be so worthwhile. I'm interested in the audience's opinion. Like, have you had to do that? Have you had those conversations with your teams? How have you maybe adjusted some of the thinking around like lead gen versus demand gen? 
education and kind of those things Susanna was talking about. Um, Cause I know it can be hard sometimes to change a leader's mind or a department's mindset. If you're very stuck in a very strict marketing attribution format. Um, so feel free to drop in the chat. If you've had any issues with that, any successes with that would love to know. But now we are gonna go into our next segment and this one's all for Sarah. So this one is called Recipes for Success. So Recipes for Success is all about marketers testing out new experiments and then what they learned from it. So Sarah, what do you have to share today about an experiment you ran and the fascinating results you got? So mine is actually, what's interesting is when you think about an experiment, I feel like it's usually something that's like net new to the organization you've never done before. But the most recent one when we were prepping for this that stood out to me was, I feel like anyone that's on this call or listening into this on demand, 2023, we really had to take a real microscope to our budgets. And like, are we spending our money and our resources in the right ways when things tighten up and with economic headwinds and yada, 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 we've all heard it, we're over it. However, one of the things that happened, I feel like to most of us is paid media spend, ABM, that type of stuff got pretty hyper scrutinized by leadership team because Susanna, you made the point, I'm not going to just drive pipeline from one ad click. So it's the easiest thing to kind of come and bring like scrutiny to because it's really, it's a little bit harder to show that influence. But as someone in demand gen, I was, I'm really convinced like there is value in ABM, there's value in paid media, there's value in warming up accounts. So the test that we ran was like, how can I do a really small test to bring back to my executive team that this is worthwhile? And I kind of just wanted to take you guys through the different steps that I did to sort of get that budget unlocked again in the later half of 2023. And the first thing was actually just defining the audience. We have a pretty large TAM that we'll go after. And I obviously couldn't warm up every single one of those accounts. It was too expensive. So deciding what is a small but effective for our organization test group that we can run this against. And from a demand gen side, again, I live in data. What I wanted to do was just say, here's our audience. I know from data, this is the audience that performs best. I'm going to tell you, sales team, that these are our target accounts to test. Found out rather quickly that does not go over well. And they were like, we want to have say in this. We talk to those accounts every day. We know who's good. And then the second sort of like shortcoming we found was I said, okay, well, why don't you guys tell me which accounts that you would like in this? That was a whole process. And then the sweet spot, third time's a charm was I brought a list. I said, here's like, say 500 accounts, sales team, you go through and tell me which one of these accounts in here you would remove. So we gave them the option to like still be involved in the process, but they weren't having to choose the accounts. It was more of an elimination process. So that really helped us get to a an audience size that was one, manageable from a budget perspective, and two, it got buy-in from our sales team because they felt like we were actually marketing was supporting them on the accounts that they cared the most about. So we got it down to a pretty small subset of accounts that we could run this test against. And then the next thing that we had to do was how do we have a really good, um, how are we testing it against an audience? We need sort of that baseline that we can say like, yes, this like test group performed better than our baseline. And it was a good challenge to try to find the right accounts because it's easy to say like, oh, when you just compare it to all of the accounts that are in our TAM, this performed better, but we needed something much more specific. So we actually ended up taking our test list and just splitting into two. And we said, here's our baseline. This is the accounts that we're not going to run any paid media against. We're not going to run any ABM activities against. That's going to be the baseline. And then we're going to take the other half and we're going to run actual like ABM tactics against them. We're going to run ads. And I gave myself one quarter and about $10,000 and said, like, we're going to see and track this every single day, every single week until we have the data to prove that this is worthwhile. We started with, you know, really running through an exercise of making sure based on our buying stages, are we showing the right messaging? What's the really valuable content that we're sending them to? So we're actually educating them and not just yelling about our brand to this audience segment. We tweaked the ads quite a bit. You know, we did some tests. We I was in it weekly because I really wanted to have like my hands in this to make sure it was going the way I wanted it to and making sure that I was turning off any creative that was underperforming. If it wasn't meeting sort of like the threshold of all the other ads, it was immediately turned off. And again, I was just putting this all in a deck and saying, we're watching this. Here's what we're doing to make sure that this money is spent well and effectively. And then what was great is at the end of the quarter, after all of this work, 
we had a really great deck that we we're able to bring to our leadership team and say like, hey, compared to our baseline audience, that was the exact same as the one that we ran this test against, we were able to see more pipeline driven, which, okay, that's great. But even more importantly, it was progressing faster. So we do have some longer deal cycles. I think you you kind of mentioned sometimes yours, Susana, are plus a year. Ours can range from a couple months to six months to eight months, depending on if it's SMB or enterprise. But what I was able to show is the progression through the funnel, even if it wasn't closed one revenue yet, they were moving through our buying opportunity stages so much quicker. Um, and then the other really important thing that we were able to prove is it was easier for our outbound sales team to book meetings with that subset of our audience that we ran the ABM ads against. And that was the narrative that I wanted to tell my executive team was marketing isn't going to drive sourced pipeline from these ads, from these direct mail pieces. But what we are going to do is make our outbound job way easier. And we're able to go and say like, hey, when they worked these accounts that had actually hit interest stage, they were doing it based off of this. We had warmed them up until they hit the right stages. They are driving much more pipeline from them and better quality pipeline with much less effort. So it was it was a really fun exercise to go to. And I will say at the end of it, we were able to then get more budget turned on and expand the audience from like a couple hundred to a couple thousand. And we're still running the same tests. We still have the same measuring formats. Um, and it was really fun. It was a fun exercise to go through. It really put me through. I had to try a lot harder to prove the value of this, but it really made me realize what's important to my leadership team and to my sales team, which is making sure their job is easier. Oh, you just said it. You said it and my heart lit up when you're like, marketing should not be the one who's making that sourced pipeline because it's so true. And so often we feel that pressure to have your source be as just much or, you know, somewhere close to your influence, right? Or your accelerated. And, you know, it, again, it comes back to what both of you have talked about of like, you can't just expect like a stranger to go from zero to like girlfriend, boyfriend or boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. Like, you know, you like you have to open that door. You have to build that relationship. You have to like make that time and that commitment and that trusted, loved brand again to be able to then get to that point. So the fact that you actually said it like verbatim, like that source is not really going to come from us. Yeah, every once in a while it might. And, and there might be a magical moment where you know, X, Y, Z aligns and poof, but oh my gosh, like I wish more people would say what you just said, Sarah. And that, and that experiment is super fascinating too. So and I, thank I think what was really interesting to your point is it was really easy before this experiment to say marketing can't source. Marketing isn't going to source a ton of pipeline, but saying it is one thing, but that's also then hard to prove. Then they're like, Hey, what's, what's the value then? And so for me to go, okay, well, I'm going to prove to you how much easier this makes driving just all of our pipeline made sure I was aligning to the business objectives. It wasn't just me being like, oh, marketing doesn't source pipeline. I was saying, you know what? We can help make someone else's job easier. We can still drive pipeline for the organization, but I need to have the, the data and the narrative to prove that to you. I can't just kind of use it as a, oh, sorry, kind of moment. Susanna, do you I <laughs> yeah, I first of all, I love this um, for multiple reasons. And I also love Dan Pereira's comment saying love takes time. Mm -hmm. it, it does right between sales and marketing as well. And I love that Sarah and team are, are using a single uh, metric, you know, team source revenue really in this case. And I want to highlight how much of a like how choosing the right metric is such an important decision because it will shape your perception, marketing's perception, your your value within the organization, the perception of your performance and everything. And in a highly sales driven organization like us in B2B, for example, uh, you know, if if your if, if your main KPI as marketing is to generate leads, for example, or even pipeline that can that can actually set you back because it's highly you know you you can easily manipulate that metric um and it will always show that 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 age old you know drama between sales and marketing it will 
constantly come back with, you know, oh, but the leads are bad and you're not following up fast enough because it's it's not really directly um, linked to business results. So if you're looking at team source pipeline and then you're looking at quality metrics, like you mentioned, Sarah, are those accounts converting faster into bigger deals? How are they entering the pipeline? How are they converting and where that we are actually going after in marketing via ABM or whatever, then the ones we are not going after, that will actually easily show your value. It, yeah, granted, it takes time to educate the C-suite, but you have to sit down and and talk. And, and trust me, they will understand because no one's going to panic if you tell sales that you're going to move from uh, delivering 4,000 leads a year to 400, but better quality. They're not going to panic and say, oh, no, please don't do that. Yeah. You just have to actually like make sure that happens, right? Like, <laughs> you just have to make sure you deliver on that. Promise. Yeah, I know, easier said than done, but yeah. <laughs> and it totally. takes time. It takes time, right? But um, love takes time. Okay. Love takes time theme of this episode, I think. Okay, well, we are getting into our next segment, which is actually a brand new one for Donuts and Demand, and I am so here for it. So we are jumping into the fryer. Yay! I like how the donuts are like excited that they're jumping. Me too. I was saying, I like that. Yay! I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> Let's go. Want to get Let's into go. the fryer. Well, into the fryer is the moment our guests can take to kind of do a uh, grill, a roast of terrible demand gen bad habits. So what is what are marketers doing out there that you're like, why are we still doing this? You know, if anyone was on our last episode, we talked a lot about like what demand gen marketers should unlearn going into 2024. So similar flavor there. So I'm going to start with Susanna. So what demand gen practices are you throwing into the fire today? Uh, um, the first one is definitely, um, the marketing industry needs to stop calling contacts leads because that confuses sales that confuses everybody. You're not, you're not generating leads with content syndication, you know, or webinar registrations. Again, we've talked about spending time and understanding the dark funnel and all the engagement that goes into not converting on a single ad and so on and so forth. So please stop calling contact leads. And then another one would be um, going back around content creation. So one, gating your content. If you want to build that brand again, before people spend money with you, they'll spend time with you. If you, if you gate your content, you, you'll just lock them out of spending time with you. And that creating a hundred mediocre content a year is hard and expensive, but also creating 10 game-changing assets a year is hard. Could be expensive, but both are really hard. So choose your hard wisely. Stop churning out content in a content factory and really think about how you can you know, um, just start creating very few hero pieces that, that are really excellent, game-changing, will resonate with your audience and then slice and dice to smaller pieces and create once and distribute endlessly. Oh, that's that's great stuff. And again, you can't jump the gun in building those relationships, right? And that, ooh, that, that uh, contacts as leads thing, that is, yes, OMG, yes. Um, Oh, so much, so much there. Um, and I will say on that content piece, uh, one thing I want to kind of put out in the atmosphere of the audience here and anyone who's watching this on demand, I'm interested, demand generation marketers, would you be interested in a compensation report? So Goldcast for the past three years has created an event marketers compensation report that digs into salaries for field and event marketers across the US this next year. We're actually going to do international, hopefully, we'll see. Uh, so if you're international, please take our survey when it launches in the next few weeks. But I'm interested, demand gen marketers, is that something attractive to you? Is that a piece of content that that, like Susanna said, is that one of those 10 hitter home content pieces for you? Let me know. Uh, so Sarah, now over to you. What demand gen practices are you throwing into the fire or the fire, the fryer, whatever? Yeah, same thing. <laughs> uh, I actually just have one and it's less of a tactic and just more of a concept. And for me, it is that 
marketing is this like black and white. So I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'm really trying to grow my audience and it, I just find it so valuable to have a, a community, especially when we're a little more virtual, but it is the idea that like, if you're doing something one way, it's good. And if you're doing something another way, it's bad. And I think especially this year, it's been very tough and it's very easy to get discouraged. You know, I've talked to a lot of marketers and they're like, yeah, this year was, you know, we'd look at pipeline in some months, it's really good. And some months it's really bad. And to then turn around and compound it by looking at people in your network and people that you are trying to learn from. And they're saying, Hey, if you're doing this this way, this is wrong is really hard. Just like mentally and emotionally for everyone. I think just in marketing, because for me, I always come back to, if it's working for you, keep doing it. Like if you've done something and this playbook is working for you and your organization is still doing well with it, just because you've seen four or five people on LinkedIn or you're at a conference and they're saying it's the wrong way to do it, take it with a grain of salt. You don't have to change what you're doing. Now on the flip side, if they're sharing stuff and it really resonates with you and you want to test it and try it, I think it's a great place to start getting ideas and do those tests, but do test it. Don't just take it as like gospel of like, oh, someone said this is the right way to do it. I'm going to do a big shift. And if it doesn't work for you, I think you have to come in with a little less ego and say like, if this doesn't work, that's okay. I think there's so much gray area in marketing of what's good and what's bad. And every organization is different and every buyer is different. So I've marketed to marketers. I've marketed to people in cybersecurity. What works to drive demand with someone in cybersecurity is vastly different than what works to drive demand from someone in marketing. And so I think just looking at things in very black and white can be hard on us. So from a demand gen perspective, test it for your own org and your own audience before you think it is the end all be all. Uh, it reminds me to our first like launch episode of Donuts and Demand and Lashana Jackson from Intuit MailChimp was on and she was talking about how at one point in time, every marketer out there was like, email is dead, email is dead. And it was just like this thing that just like someone said it, someone grabbed onto it And like all of us were like, kind of like, what are you talking about kind of thing? But yet we just kept regurgitating it out. And you're so right. Like just because one big old talking head says it and a few other people say it at a conference and, you know, they might run some ads against you with that messaging. Like unless you really know that that is true in your own organization and your buyers and your personas, like exactly take it with a grain of salt uh, don't take it, uh, absolutely at face value. Um, you know, I think there's some things that are obvious, you know, don't put, actually, I don't know. I was gonna say, don't put broken links in emails, but granted I have done that. And then the next email I put out was epic because I did it. So I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So yeah, you never know. And I do think too, with your point about someone says like email is dead. That's a great example. I've just found over time marketing cyclical, like something will be popular for a little bit. And then all of a sudden it'll kind of fade into the background. And then suddenly here we are like email marketing is one of those where suddenly it's popular again and people are talking about email marketing. So don't totally just say something is dead. You don't need to use it. Keep it in your back pocket because almost like fashion, it's cyclical. (laughs) It'll come back in time. So make sure you keep it top of mind. (laughs) No channel or yeah yeah no channel or tactic is that you just you just didn't try hard enough yeah right yeah ah, Susanna calling it how it is um yeah and don't get me down the <laughs> fashion road because I'm seeing all the 90s stuff come back and I was like am I really oh, just it hurts. Oh, this is coming back <laughs> Well, we have one final segment before we open the floor to Q&A. So if you do have a question burning in your head, feel free to jump over into the Q&A. And as a reminder, you can always email me for an episode. We actually have four people emailing questions. So we have a deck already built. So we're going to hop over into the donut donut dedication section. That might be my favorite sound effect there. So donut dedication, oh my gosh, why can I not say this today? Donut Dedications is all about providing shout outs to B2B marketers or B2B brands who are just killing it out there. So Sarah, Susanna, I don't know which one of you wants to go first, but this is just a very quick moment for you to shine the spotlight on either a marketer and or brand that you are just loving what they're putting out into the market. Go first, Sarah. Okay. So first is my individual person I want to give a shout out to, and this is a little cheesy, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm really lucky that my sister-in-law is also in marketing. Her name is Megan Guy. She works, she was in customer marketing at Stripe. She's now moved into other like executive strategic at Stripe. Um, 
So she's not into Mangen, but having someone in the family and at family dinners who is in B2B marketing has just been so invaluable because we'll be at Thanksgiving dinner having some wine and I'll be able to just bounce ideas off of her. And like, it's such a safe space. So she's a really great marketer. She's helped shape me a lot in marketing. And I really appreciate that. The brand I want to give a shout out to is such a cliche, but I'm going to do it anyways. And that is Gong. And the reason why, one, is they're a great brand. Two, as someone who is the end user of our product and we sell to demand gen, our product is for demand gen, I'm in demand gen, Gong has been just a masterclass in using your um, platform's data to write really useful content. So to this point of like, don't just put out a bunch of content because you can, their content is so useful at making you better at your job. And it's just been such an inspiration and something I've strived to do at my own organization, which is taking the data that we have in our own product and turning it into content to make our end users better and not sell them our product. I just want to make you better at your job and a better demand gen marketer. And our platform has the data to help us do that. So I've just really appreciated what Gong did with Gong Labs. And I've always wanted to try to emulate that in our own marketing. Oh my gosh, haven't we all? I totally agree. And if when you hear Gong, if you think the synonymous, you know, Devin Reed, I will say we did have Devin on during our AI summit a few weeks ago. He came on to talk all about content repurposing and how that's the next frontier of AI. So if you are a fangirl, fanboy of Devin Reed and the work he did at Gong, feel free to hop over to our AI summit on our website or on demand events. Check out Devin's session. It was excellent. And yeah, I also agree. I think at least once every day, like how can I mine my own gold cast data to do this? I haven't gotten there yet, but I will one day. So Susanna, who are your uh, donut dedications yeah. going out to today? And I was on the AI Summit and it was indeed an excellent session. So I do uh, <laughs> yeah, encourage everyone to, to go back and rewatch. Um, gosh, I have so many, but I'll try and pick a couple. Um, so uh, John Miller, he's obviously a legend in B2B marketing, and he's putting out so much amazing, you know, uh, knowledge and um, just the opportunity to learn from him. Um, he's one of the founders of Marketo and Engageo that got bought by Demandbase. So, you know, he's the OG of uh, B2B marketing. And somehow he always know what the future holds. So um, John Miller, definitely one to follow. Um, Latney from Sixth Sense. I mean, she's a powerhouse, you all know. Um, and um, Tom Wentworth from Recorded Future. I do love to follow him. I have to say, um, um, of course, you know, we want to shout out a, 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 a powerhouse woman as well, besides Latney, who's maybe lesser known. Olga Denisova, um, she was the one, uh, she was the CMO of SEMrush, just recently left. And and actually SEMrush is one of the brands that I wanted to mention uh, that I admire for their marketing strategies. But I also want to shout out Bolaji. Uh, I'll, I'll put his name in, in the chat or everyone's names if you want to follow them. But Bolaji is amazing with uh, how he's building audiences and he's been building audiences uh, for 20 years. Um, just so much we can learn from him as well around uh, building demand and, and generating demand because um, that's all about building audiences around a point of view or a thought. And we all talk about so talk about thought leadership so much but you know everyone wants to create thought leadership content but very few actually including you know individuals and brands actually have leading thoughts so that's um he's definitely worth following and then so again semrush is one of the brands and i i want to mention gym pass i've recently came across their podcast called murder in hr it is genius, you guys. Check it out. Um, Gym Pass um, is is a very cool brand to to look into as well. I love it, and I will say, Sam Rush is like at least shared once a week between me and Chai, who runs our social media with me, because their social game is just mwah, like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. People want to steal all their ideas. Sorry, Sam Rush, if you see our social content, you're like, hmm, this seems familiar. Yeah, it's because I stole it from you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, y'all, we are about to jump into our Q&A, but I will drop one thing before we jump into that Q&A. 
is that did you know, because you have now been at a Goldcast event, you qualify to review us on G2. I know I'm asking you to do something, but I think if you have loved the Goldcast experience, I would love to know about it. My team would love to know about it. So if you have a few moments, there's gonna be a ticker that pops up. If you would want to uh, review us, leave us a review on G2 about your experience, about the platform, about what you thought about being an audience member for the show. We would love to see that. And maybe there'll be something down the road if you do that, wink, wink. But I uh, would love to get a G2 review from anyone in the audience today. But now we're going to jump into Q&A. So the first question we have is from, and I'm going to say an asterisk. If I butcher your name, I'm very sorry. I'm trying my best. Uh, Mary Ann Schroer, a director, uh, bleh, director of marketing at Parity. She asked, what specific tactics and initiatives are you planning to run to get ahead of the competition in January? What things should we be planning for now? So Susanna, Sarah, who wants to tackle this one? Um, so I actually, so I'll take a first stab at this. I don't, I don't think I'm looking into Q1 of next year with anything like groundbreakingly new. And I say that with the asterisk that if 2023 has taught me anything, it's that things can change really fast. What I thought was going to happen six months ago is vastly different than what actually happened. So many times in 2023, we would say we're seeing glimmers of hope and then maybe we aren't and now we are again. So times change. So with that being said, I'm trying to be really focused in on like the foundations of what we're doing and continuing that. I think marketers, I have a tendency, myself included, to do something once, find a new shiny object and move on to it. And I'm trying to be very um, practiced in doing things long term. Once we find something that works, continuing that. So 2023, I think I spent a lot of time making sure what we're doing is the right mix of things. Maybe in next year, we're going to obviously start doing smaller tests and adding some stuff back into the mix. But I'm going in with the same mentality I have right now, which is we've got that foundation. We're going to keep optimizing it the best that we can but I want to caution myself from jumping to a new shiny object and forgetting about those foundational things that we established and know are working and that were in 2023. Mm. Don't get distracted by the shiny objects. Yes. Susanna, anything to add to that? Um, maybe not a external uh, initiative, but something we are definitely doing because I, I believe you all can relate to the fact that we are all asked to become more efficient. Uh, uh, some of us are on slimmer teams or tighter budgets. So definitely make the most of what we have, um, you know, optimize and audit our uh, do the do a channel audit definitely you know cancel we are I'm looking at all our tech stack right now and see if we can cancel some subscriptions quite frankly come January um, and definitely zero in on building and optimizing our first party channels that starts with looking at data hygiene of our CRM and our email database and our website you know is there anything we can do to 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 optimize our our web um, to create better experiences and most importantly doubling down on customer and employee advocacy i mean we've been doing that i'm not going to lie it's not going to be something we're just starting but we're pushing more and more towards you know retention how do we create more retention focused programs Oh, lots to do by January, y'all. So we're going to jump into our second question. This is from Alyssa Wells. She's a marketing manager manufacturing at HSO. So her question is, how do I help our BD sales teams move leads through the pipeline to closed one? Pipeline acceleration programs. Um, if you know, because you know who they are already the opportunity is open right then you can go in and try and um again get in front of those accounts with content that is bingeable that is educational that will help them understand why they should be um, doing business with you um you know push customer testimonials or or case studies in front of them use maybe a customer like um, I, I got to give it to you guys uh, at the AI Summit uh, with um, with uh, the live demo that, that Devin um, did for you. That's turning your existing customer into an advocate who will help you find new ones, right? So 
doing maybe uh, co uh, co marketing activities with your with your customers. Um, um, that will definitely because everyone just wants to see how others have already won with your product. So if you can demonstrate that, they'll be able to close deals faster. Um, sorry, I went off camera for a second. I thought my computer had enough battery to make it through this and it proved me a liar. Uh, <laughs> so I think one of the things that we've been looking at is one, a really close partnership with our BD managers and asking them what is going to be valuable. And the feedback that we got is creating assets or things that they can use to help educate the buyer from meeting booked before that first meeting. So what we found is like to help prevent drop off people not showing up to that first meeting is we really partner with them to say like, what are the, the feedback you're getting in the first call where they're like, we don't know what you do or, you know, something that's holding up that progression. And so our marketing team went through and created assets and templates that they can use that after the first meeting is booked, we have sort of like a little drip sequence that sends them some things to sort of get them excited about the first meeting of like what you're going to learn and what's going to happen to make sure that, you know, if the meeting's booked, especially in the holidays, two weeks from now, two months from now, I want to keep you intrigued because after that first meeting, we know you're going to move through faster. But the hardest part is getting them to show up to that first meeting after it's booked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will say from personal experience, one thing you can do too is ask questions before you get on that first call because, and, and I'm coming from a customer perspective. This was a call with a CSM of a vendor we use, but um, we had someone transition off. So some of us are learning a new tool. We had a call with our CSM and they did not answer any of my questions on that call. And I spent 30 minutes with them. And at the end they were like, oh, and let me know if there's anything else. I was like, well, I wanted to learn X, Y, Z, but we didn't actually cover any of that. So don't be afraid to ask what they're wanting to get out of it. Because if you know that ahead of time, you can cater to that. So we're gonna Not hop that. into um, our third question. This is from uh, Shreya Jane, Director Marketing Operations at Snap Logic. So in regards to finding marketing attribution, are they aligned with sales and other departments? If they are aligned, what process do they have to ensure their attribution model is accurate and representative of where deals are coming from? Oh, that's a doozy of a question. Um, do you have a question, but I feel like I get the, the concept behind it. Um, and I know we touched on this a little bit as far as attribution. My first thought is there's no perfect attribution model. And if you say that you've got it figured out, I don't believe you necessarily because it's so hard to capture everything that happens. I, we talked about this earlier in the show, but there is so much that happens behind the scenes that are happening in communities, that's happening on social, that's happening at events that you just can't capture in an attribution model. Um, I've gone through some trials and tribulations of building First, it was like a sourced model and then a full influence model. And then it's gone back to a sourced model uh, because it's hard. It's hard to build something that's good and reliable. I think at the end of the day, what it comes down to for me is all I really care about is, is sales getting the revenue that we need. And like the attribution model to support that could be different for every organization. And from my perspective in marketing, I want to know what I can be doing to help influence it, but that's not the attribution model that I necessarily bring to an executive meeting because it's very, it, there's a lot of things that happen. So I will say I'm always redoing our attribution model. It is never a just set it and forget it. There's always things that we realize we are losing out on that we need to like add in there. Um, but really what I'm focused on is do we have enough pipeline to cover what our sales team needs to close yeah. to get closing revenue? Yeah, I think um, even up to uh, a few years ago, it was a lot simpler to link marketing spend to revenue. But with how the buyer journey for 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 the modern buyers have changed, with you know B two C and consumer experiences really shaping B two B buying um, um, habits as well, it's it's really hard. But it I hate to say it depends, but it really depends. Are you a you know, are you a small startup? Are you product uh, led? Are you marketing led? Are you are you sales driven? Um, if if for a, a large B two B enterprise like Nokia, for example, um, it wouldn't make sense to do marketing source or not for all of our um, campaigns. Some some campaigns maybe when we are entering new markets, you know, for more mature markets that are 
we have hundreds of AEs or thousands of uh, you know account reps who have been married to their accounts. It's not going to be marketing source. It would never be accepted. So it has to be something. It 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 shouldn't be influenced either because then you're going in and just showing everything is influenced. Touch everything. Touch everybody. Yeah. So we've influenced all. Marketing's needed. You know, and maybe sales is not meeting their their pipeline and 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 bottom line goals yet you're claiming you've been so successful influencing everything um so i again just going back to shared team revenue goals that sarah mentioned as well um and and maybe that's not attribution but from again from john miller um he he recently had a post where he said you can try try and frame um, your CEOs and your C-suites thinking um, about marketing and shift them from thinking of marketing as a cost center. If you shift from um, cost per lead or customer acquisition cost, again, framing marketing as a cost center to investment per opportunity. So it really matters how you're um, um, measuring things right? Are you looking at cost per acquisition or are you looking at investment per opportunity? That may be a small change, but but the optics will be much, much, much better for from a marketing perspective. Oh, wow. Well, that was a great Q&A. Um, we had one more uh, in the pipeline, but we are at less than a minute left on this episode, guys. It went by so fast, but I want to thank Susanna and Sarah for coming on and enjoying the afternoon with me, having some donuts, talking about demand. It's been great. A few quick reminders. Um, if you are interested in launching an event series in 2024, or even if you've done one before and you're just wondering how to improve going into the new year, definitely click that CTA button and roll series masterclass. We'd love to see you there. Uh, we have so many, we have 12 industry experts joining us across those four classes. Um, so definitely hit that CTA if you're interested, but thank you all again. Thank you, Susanna and Sarah. It was a wonderful chat and so much to think about going into the rest of this week and into 2024. Yeah, thank Loved you it. for having Thanks, us. Guys. Bye everyone, enjoy. Bye all. Bye.